welcome to Scaling Graphite at Criteo. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, there is a microphone just near the piano there, so please take it. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Corentin, I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm working in the observability team at Criteo. So we deal with metrics and logs mostly. And I, uh, I work on Graphite. Uh, before that, I used to work on Bigtable and Colossus at Google, so I have a um, strong background in file system and other bases. Uh, and today, we are going to talk about graphite. But since it's a big data conference, we are going to talk about big graphite. Uh, has anybody here already used graphite? Yeah, okay, and Cassandra? Okay, good. So what's graphite for those who, who don't really know? Graphite does two things. First, it stores numeric time series data. So think metric name, timestamp, and point. And then you can get this data back in graphs or just in JSON. Uh, the main component of Graphite is Graphite Web, which is the web application where you can do graphs and dashboards. Uh, there is a UI to do dashboards, but currently it's mostly deprecated by Grafana. I guess most of you have used Grafana already. Uh, but still, the API is super important because it allows you on Grafana on other tools to list metrics and evaluate expressions with these metrics. Here you have two examples. The first one will just list all the metrics matching my.metrics.star. And the second one will make the sum of these metrics on a period of time of 10 minutes. So that's really all that Graphite Web does. Uh, the second component is Carbon. Uh, carbon is the component that will, that will read the points and store them on disk. You have multiple kinds of carbon. The first one is the carbon relay, which receives points and sends them back to something else. And the second most important carbon is carbon cache, which will read points and write them to a persistent storage layer, like disk. The protocol to do that is very simple. You send lines on TCP and UDP. The line will contain the metric name, the timestamp, and the value. And that goes to a carbon instance, which will write it to disk then Graphite Web can read it back. How do you write, back to, how do you write that to disk? Uh, the default database that we use is Whisper, which is shipped with, uh, with Graphite by default. Uh, it stores points as timestamps on, on the value, where the timestamp is simply an integer, and the value is a double. Uh, it supports multiple resolution. Uh, here you have an example with uh, one minute for eight days, one hour for 30 days, and one day for one year. That means that in the first or in the last eight days, you will have a resolution of one minute, so one point per minute. Then in the next 30 days, you will have one point per hour, and then in the year before that, you will have one point per day. You need that because when you have a lot of metrics, you can't just store one point per minute for one year for all the metrics. That, you use, that would use a lot of space. Uh, at Criteo, the one minute for 80 days takes 70% of the space, and then the rest is used by the overall resolution. So imagine that if, you can imagine that if we are storing that for one year with one minute, it will take a huge amount of space. Um, with this um, resolution, or retention policy as we call it, uh, you get approximately 10,000 points per metric. And one of the issues with Whisper is that when you create a new metric, when you send a metric that didn't exist before, it will just allocate all the space that it might use, which uh, is up to, well, for this retention policy, 100 kilobytes per metric. So if one application goes wrong and trades millions of metrics, you can easily fill up your disk in a few minutes. So that's pretty annoying with, with Whisper. How do we use Graphite at Criteo? Uh, we have more than five data centers, thousands of machines and applications, and that translates to 50 million of metrics, maybe more now. Um, from these metrics, we read 10,000 uh, metrics per second with dashboards and alerts, and we write 500,000 points per second. So that's quite a lot of traffic there. Uh, we have, I think, more than 1,000 dashboards and a lot of alerts, and all these refresh, refresh every five minutes. So that's a lot of traffic, but most of the time that's a lot of traffic on exactly the same metrics because the dashboard will always read like CPU for, for this application or something like that. So that's how we use it. 
Uh, it looks a little bit like that. So you have applications sending points using UDP to carbon relays in the local data centers. And then these keep an in-memory queue and contact the global graphite cluster using TCP. Then uh, carbon cache will write data to disk and graphite can read the data from disk and serve it to Grafana. Uh, if you look at this, you have obvious reliability issues. Uh, the cross data center links fail a lot, like probably every two weeks here, so you can't just rely on one data center having all the data. Uh, the dependencies of Graphite can fail too. The load balancer that we use, memcache for caching and everything. And we need canaries for deployment. If we deploy in a version, we don't want to break everything and have no way to, like, to, fall, back and, to fall back on something that works. So what we ended up doing last year is simply installing a second data center that stores exactly the same thing as the first one, and then the user will be redirected to the data center that currently works. And if both of them are working, then they can use any of them. So that's a small thing that we did uh, with a replication factor of two. Still, that was not enough, but first, how many machines do we use for that? Uh, that's quite a lot of hardware. Uh, in total, 20 per graphite cluster, 20 machines, and the machines are quite big. 32 CPUs, 200 gigabytes of RAM, and one terabyte of SSD. So for our, all our application, we store, I think, between one and five terabytes of data. Um, um, a lot of metric. And it's Mostly carbon cache, so the component that is writing metrics to disk. So what doesn't work with graphite? Um, scaling graphite is super hard. Uh, when we want to add a new carbon cache instance, it takes us one week, and we have to basically shut down the cluster because you can't really use it during that time. Um, and the components are really linked together. You need to have one graphite web instance with each carbon cache instance. And if one of them becomes a bottleneck, you need to scale everything together. And that can waste a lot of resources. Uh, the other issue that we had is that the clustering code in Graphite is super naive. So one big query will break all the cluster for everybody, which means very poor isolation. Um, each time you do one query, it will fan out to all the Graphite cache instance, all of them, and get all the results back, which means that the more instance you add, the more work you need to do, uh, which also doesn't really work when you reach huge number of instances. And the tools to manipulate Whisper files are not super robust, so we had a lot of corruptions on repairing or reconciliating the two clusters that we have so that they have the same data. It tends to take one to two weeks, so we really can't make it work. Um, the thing is that all these issues that we have with this database that was not distributed at first have been solved by uh, other, other software. If you think of Cassandra, React, and others, they know how to fix that kind of data distribution. Um, for in Cassandra, for example, you can just send multiple queries and take whatever was the majority. Uh, and it's super easy to add a new node. You just add the node, ask it to join, and then you're done. So because it sounded like this problem has, had been solved by others, we, we started thinking about integrating both. And that's how big graphite, big graphite became, became a thing. Um, the, first thing that, the first thing that we did before starting to write code is, of course, checking what the others were doing. So that's what was the time series ecosystem at the time. Uh, OpenTSDB is interesting, uh, and it's based on HBase uh, on top of Hadoop, and you can store a lot of data there. The thing is that installing a Hadoop cluster isn't really the easiest thing to do. On that criteria, we have only two of them. Uh, at some point, we want to have three graphite clusters, so that was not really an option. Also, too many moving parts, and you want your monitoring system to be simple and robust. So depending on Hadoop was not really the best idea. 
Also, there is no graphite compatibility there. Uh, another option was Cyanite uh, that some of you might have used. Uh, it used Cassandra and Elasticsearch. Uh, again, here, for us, depending on Cassandra plus Elasticsearch was just too many dependencies. We wanted to have as little dependency as, as we could because the monitoring system really need to be the last thing that fails. Uh, also, Cyanite doesn't behave exactly like carbon and graphite. And because we have thousands of dashboards and alerts, we can't afford to change the behavior of the API. So we need to have something that behaves exactly like the old system was behaving. So Cyanite was not perfect. Also, it's in Clojure. Nobody has ever used Clojure at Kto, so not really easy to contribute. Um, there is also CuriousDB that add a bit of graphite compatibility, but isn't super active. Also depend on Elasticsearch for finding metrics. Um, relies on outdated li libraries to contact Cassandra. So it didn't really work for us. Um, there are other things in FlexDB, but it doesn't support graphite. Um, I think React.ts was something at the time, still doesn't support graphite. So for us, we ended up with just building something on top of Cassandra. Why did we pick Cassandra? Because we already had um, Cassandra clusters at Triteo, so we could just leverage that and use whatever was installed already. And the idea was to have a drop-in graphite plugin that will, will just use an existing Cassandra cluster and work, the same way that graphite worked before. So that's what we wanted to do. And the idea is that if one of your components becomes a bottleneck, you just add more of it. And you can choose which one, because like, they are not locked together anymore. Um, how do you build a plugin for, for Graphite? Graphite, since uh, 1.0, which was released, I think, two months ago, has a very nice plugin system. Uh, as you remember, there are two components, two main components for Graphite. The first one is Carbon, which listens for points and writes them down to disk or to a persistent storage layer. And Graphite Web that reads these points back and displays them. So for Carbon, the API is simply, uh, does a metric exist? Uh, if it doesn't, create the metric. And once you have the metric, just update it with a point or with multiple points. Uh, that's really the only three functions that you need to implement. Uh, and for Graphite Web, you need to be able to find a list of metrics based on the globe. Globe being, for example, uptime.star. So it will find uptime.machine A, uptime.machine B, and everything. And the second one is once you have a list of metrics, fetch the points for a given interval of time. Uh, the example that we have here is uh, fetching all the points in the last 60 seconds for uptime node A. And again, you need to implement two functions. Uh, graphite is in Python, so you need to implement them in Python, but you do not need to implement everything in Python. If you want, you can just implement the bridge in Python and have the REST API implemented anything that provides something like that. Uh, so that was the first thing, how to integrate with Graphite. Now that you know how to... So first, we did a simple plugin that was just writing to text files. And then we had to think about how to write that to Cassandra. And it took us some time, because at the time, nobody in the team had used Cassandra before, so we had to learn and iterate. So we started with what will be the typical workload for Graphite in Cassandra. So the first thing that you need to do is store points. Uh, points are tuples of metric timestamp and values. You need to support multiple resolutions, as, we s uh, as we've seen before. On the read path, we just write points as they come. And on the read path, we'll read series of points for a specific metric, usually to display a graph. Uh, but points are not the only thing that you need to store in Graphite. You also need to store the metadata, which is the list of metrics that you have, and be able to filter these. Uh, as you've seen in Whisper, each metric is a file. So a lot of the API behaves like LS would behave. Uh, so you have folders and files, basically, in that. 
um, on for metadata, the right path is just writing, well, creating a new metric, and the right path is getting a list of metrics for a glob. So we had basically two main blobs of data to store. Um, we had the right patterns, the read patterns, and from that we had to design the schemas for Cassandra. And here I will explain what exactly we did with Cassandra. Since not all of you have used it, uh, let's go back to what is Cassandra and how does it work. Uh, it's a distributed database that is basically a bi-dimensional map. Uh, the first index is the row of a partition key, which will decide on which machine the data will be stored. And the second index is the column of a clustering key, which will tell Cassandra where on the machine the value is stored. Uh, a nice thing with the clustering key or the column is that you can do range queries, like select from this column to this column, which is pretty convenient. You can't do that with the row key or the partition key because it gives you the machine. So with Cassandra, either you read from all the machines and it's super slow and doesn't work, or you need to pick explicitly one single line that you want to read from and then tell the column in this line that you want to read. So from that, uh, we came up with a very simple schema to store time series. So you create a table named points. Uh, the row key or partition key could be the metric name. The time could be used at the column. That works pretty well because most of the time you want to read for one specific metric um, a time interval of points. So from one column to another. And that really maps well to Cassandra. And the value will be simply what we store, a double. Uh, except that that doesn't really work. Uh, Cassandra has a hard limit on the number of columns that are, no, it doesn't have a hard limit, but it, it starts breaking when you have more than 100,000 columns per row. So you don't want to, to go above that. Uh, also, if you do that and you mix all your metrics with the same resolutions in one table, you will spend a lot of time compacting and evicting expired points. And that's really not efficient. Uh, we can discuss about compaction later, but that was a hard problem to solve. So the naive schema only works if you have very few points per metric, let's say 1,000. If you have more than that, and we've seen that we do, you need to do something a little bit more complicated. So the idea here, is that first, since we have multiple resolution, we'll just create one table per resolution. And most of the time you don't mix really your resolution. You just say, I want to read points from the last eight days, and then you get one minute per point or something else. So first, one table per resolution, and all the points have the same TTL. So that, that makes a lot of things simpler. Uh, then, in the partition key, we put the higher part of the timestamp, which means that slowly the points will be sharded across multiple lines, and we are sure that we won't exceed the 100,000 uh, points per row, and that helps. And the second part of the timestamp, so the lowest part, is stored as the column of a clustering key. So that was the main change. Just do one big row per period of time, which can be one day, two days, or something like that. And then inside this period of time, use the offset as a column. Another change is that we don't only store the value, but also the count of uh, points that um, became this value. Because as you will see, when you move from the first resolution, one minute per point, to the second one, you need to aggregate a lot of points together, and you can choose multiple ways to aggregate that. Uh, the default one is average, and you can't do averages of averages to get an average, so instead we store the sum and the count, and then at the end we can just divide the sum by the count, and you get the average. So that's yeah, what we did. It's not exactly the final schema because we did more optimization, but that's the basic if you want to do a time series in Cassandra. And 
if you do select, it looks like that. So you can see the metric name. Uh, the time starts, which is always the same, and then the offset relative to, relative to this time start, and then count and value. Uh, do you have questions on the schema? Because that's quite the interesting part. If you don't, I will just skip ahead. So that was for data part. The other hard part was to list metrics. Uh, we could just have used Elasticsearch to search for things, but as we said, we wanted something simple, robust, and as little dependencies as we could. So we decided to give it a try with Cassandra. Um, and the nice thing with Cassandra, starting with 3.5, is that it has, it has SAS indexes, which allow you to do prefix, suffix, and parcel search for, for text. So what we did is that when you have a metric path, you just split on the dots, and then each part you store in a column name part zero, part one, part two, and then the last column in the metric, you just put an end marker. Which means that if you're trying to get, for example, all the metrics matching criteo.star, <coughs> you will do a select star from metrics where part zero equal criteo, part two equal end marker, and that will select all the, the metric matching that. And that's really efficient. We have um, like a find query on that, with 100 million metrics, takes, I think, 500 milliseconds, which is pretty good, and it's something that you can cache because you don't create metric a lot of time. Another thing that we've, did is inst that we've done is that instead of storing the metric name in the point table, we store a uh, UID, and then we map the name of the metric to the UID, which gives us two things. First, most of the time, the metric name is bigger than a UID, so we save space in the data, data part. And then if we want to rename the metric, we just need to add a new entry in the mapping between names on UID, and that's it. It's kind of a um, hard link on, uh, on Linux. Um, um, yeah, there is a design doc that describes in more details how it works, and a link to how SAS indexes work. Something that wasn't fun is that the way that SASE works, it still contacts all the nodes of Cassandra. And we had to, I think we used 20 nodes for the data part. So we have two separate clusters. One for data with 20 nodes, and one for metadata with only three nodes. So the search was super fast on the, the metadata one that uses <coughs> SSDs, and the data one used block um, stupid hard disks and um, it's a little, little bit slower, but it's, mm, well, well, it's better for, for the data. Uh, so more details on that. Here there was an, an example on how you do a simple glob star. But the thing is that the um, graphite patterns can be a little bit more complicated than that. So the third example, you can see that you can do more things. Basically the same thing that you will be able to do in a shell. And to do that, since the index doesn't support that uh, in Cassandra, we simply convert any pattern to a wildcard, do the query, and then do post-filtering. And surprisingly, that's, that's efficient enough for most, um, most queries. So we just do that. Uh, we could optimize for prefixes. The thing is that that would use way more space on Cassandra. So we just went with something simpler. So that was the Cassandra part. How did we do that? Uh, the other interesting part is how do we do aggregation? How do we move from one retention policy to the other from the first eight days uh, with a resolution of one minute to the next 30 days with a resolution of one hour? Uh, that thing works this way. Uh, you have multiple stages. The first one is named stage zero. So in the first stage, you have all the fine resolutions, and then at some point, when you're past the, eight, the eighth day, you need to go to the second stage. And to do that, you give all your points to an aggregation function. You create a new point that is, that is the aggregate of this period of time. So if you have one minute, then one hour, you take 60 points, you aggregate them, and then you store them. 
and you do that over and over until you reach the last stage. And when you do that, when you reach this stage, you just remove the points. So that's kind of the semantic of resolutions. That's not exactly how we implemented it. Um, so what we did instead of writing to the first table, then when they expire, read them back, write them again, we do all that on the right path. So we pre-compute aggregates and we checkpoint them every five minutes. And that's way, way simpler because we don't have to take care of periodic job, reading back data and everything. And since most of the metrics are never used again, we don't trash the cache by reading data that will be used only to be aggregated. So we leave the cache on Cassandra available for actual read queries, and we write everything with a preset TTL that will make the points expire when they should. And since we do that every five minutes, we batch everything, and that's fine. Uh, the annoying thing with that is that if your process restarts, you will just overwrite what was before, and you don't want that. So we use unique writer's ID to kind of deduplicate that. And on the read path, we merge things, things together. And since we can have multiple clusters in parallel writing to the same database, we also have replica IDs. Uh, all, the, all this thing is pretty complicated, but you, get, you can see all the explanation in the design document again. Uh, and yeah, it looks like that. So on this uh, graph, you can see the QPS to the various tables uh, of Big Graphite itself. Uh, so each table is a specific resolution. Here you can see the number of points, and then here the period for all these points. And that's the actual QPS in production. So on the green line, which is at 500 uh, kilo QPS, per second, that's the first stage, the one at one minute. Then the second one is the second stage, so when you, you get a point, every minute you write to the green table, and then every five minutes to the yellow one, and then less and less to the others. So as you see, pre-aggregating doesn't cost us much, and that was before one of the optimizations that we did. Now the yellow line is with the others at 100k QPS. Um, and that's it. And when you want to read points, you just select the table that contains points from your resolution, and you read that. Which allows you to tweak each table for the kind of world cloud that it will get, because the first one, most of the time, we know that people will get points for one single day, while the second one, we know that people will get points for, like, five months, and we can tweak them differently and tweak the cache differently to best match these workloads. Uh, so that was a lot of talking. Now let's see how long the code is to do all that. Well, that's 3,000 lines of code in Python, not really more. Um, I'm a little bit cheating here because there is more code, but it's common code that could be used to integrate other kind of databases and backends. Uh, in Big Graphite, we have the customer backends, but for testing, we also have a memory backend, and both of them are sh sharing a lot of code. And the idea is that with all this base code, you could just plug to write TS, open TSDB, or anything, even MySQL if you wanted to. And it gives you all the utility functions to do that, and you don't need to write that much code in your, in your driver. As you can see, the Cassandra driver is only 2,000 li lines of code, which really isn't m that much for what it does. Um, so yeah, as you can see, it's Python. It's, it isn't really fast. Uh, you need to use PyPy for that, uh, else it's just impossible. And that's the main reason why we have so many machines for Carbon. It's first for storage, but second for CPU, because it uses a lot of CPU. At some point, we might offload part of that in something faster. Currently, we don't. Uh, yeah, so the new cluster with uh, Cassandra is a little bit bigger because it's way easier to add machines. Uh, as you can remember, uh, before it was one week for us to add machines and the cluster had to be done. Now we just add something and then eventually it's there. Uh, I think currently it's 20 terabytes. We use only five terabytes of that. 
each point takes uh, 16 bytes, which isn't super efficient. We could do more, but the machines that we have now, since we don't need SSD, because SSD was mainly because Whisper is really not optimized, um, have 40 T of disk instead of 1 T of SSD. So we don't care about, about bytes, really. Uh, it's mostly for CPU. And we still do 1 million writes, and um, that works pretty well. Uh, but there, there is a lot of room for optimization here to reduce the, um, both the CPU usage and the, the amount of bytes, bytes per point. Some links that you can look at uh, if you're interested. Uh, the GitHub project, everything is open source. You can contribute. I think the license is Apache or something like that. The design doc, which describes exactly why we did things this way and the announcement that this kind of the article that we wrote when we announced the project and that explains the choices that we did on how the ecosystem works. Um, since we have some time left, I have backup slides. Uh, how do you monitor that your monitoring works? Uh, that's actually the first thing that we did when we started working Graphite. Before, it was mostly users coming at our desk and yelling, I can't see my points, this dashboard doesn't work. So we sat down and tried to find a few metrics, not more than five, we found four, that would tell us if the system was working or not. And we came up with these four things. Uh, the first one is the graphite web, web availability, which is a percentage of time the interface was available on a moving window of time. <coughs> Think, for example, it was available 99% of the time in the last quarter. Of course, for alerting, we don't use the quarter window. We use something like 10 minutes. You don't want to reach the end of the quarter and get the alert. Um, then we look at performances, simply the latency. How long does it take to fetch 500 metrics? Um, that's for the read path. For the write path, we send points every minute, 100 points per data center and we check how many we can read back in less than two minutes. So we mark these points on the software that's sending them to Carbon, reads them back from Graphite, and then check which one was lost in a way. And that's what we call point loss. And we try to not go above 0.5% of point loss, which is not that bad because if you remember, uh, we use UDP inside the data center, and then we have only in-memory queues, so if they are full, things will be lost. Uh, we also check the point delay. So we send the same points, and we put, the, we put timestamps as values, and then when we read them back, we do the subtraction between now and the timestamp at which the point was sent, and we check that this value doesn't exceed two to three minutes. So the, these two last metrics kind of look the same, but they are not exactly the same because you could lose only one point and not reach the 0.5%, but have one specific point that never arrives and have the delay increasing and increasing over time. And for the delay, we check the maximum delay. And that's important because on the way, you have consistent hashing for a path, so we know that some points we've always, will always take the same path on one of the paths could be broken, and we want to detect that. Of course, these paths are duplicated or replicated, so we don't alert if a single machine is done, but as long as a single logical path is broken. And that looks this way. So basically, we have an issue. We have only this dashboard to look at with these four metrics, read availability, read latency, point loss, and delay. And for most of these metrics, they are per data center. So you can see that in Tokyo at noon, we lost 0.5% of the points for one minute. And we have alerts on these metrics only. And that's way more efficient than just checking if your machines are up or down, because that actually shows you if the service is working as people are using it, and not if your server are running. You don't care if your server are running. Like, my servers could be all done. If that was fine, I will, I will be OK with that. And what are we going to do with Big Graphite? Uh, the next big project is to integrate with Prometheus. Some of you might know it. It's another monitoring toolkit. Um, 
The issue with Prometheus is that it supports only local disk. So we want to make Prometheus write in Big Graphite and read back from Big Graphite to have the Prometheus long term storage in Cassandra. And we also want to support graphite events, which are not points with only timestamp and a value, but also a string of text that could be, at this time, I did a release. And that's really useful to correlate things. You want probably to know to have release marked on your graph to see, oh, latency went up. And at the time, I did a release, so it's probably a release that was the cause. So yeah, that's what we are going to do. And that's it for the slides. Uh, do you have questions? The microphone is just near the piano there, if you want. Yeah, can you? Uh, you are using uh, Cassandra TTLs to evict uh, old nodes, old mm -hmm. points. So you don't have any problems with compactions and time zones? So no, because we use the new time window compaction strategy that does that super efficiently. And basically, all the points are ordered. And the, the old points end up in the same files that we don't compact. We just drop them. So after eight days, the file is full of points that are not, not valid anymore. And as soon as it reaches that, then we remove the file. It's not that simple, because if you activate read repairs, all the points will go into new files. And then things can be mixed together. So to do that, we are going to do two things. Uh, on the long term, we'll write a patch that isolates these points. So it will create, even uh, in the first window of time, multiple SS tables based on the time stop of the points. And on the short term, we just ignore all the points that have been read repaired. And we have a patch for that to just remove the files. So if you activate read repairs, currently you need a patched version of Cassandra. That is available on GitHub in Crypto Forks. Uh, and on the long term, this will be upstreamed, and you'll be fine. But yeah, the important part here is using uh, TWCS, which is the time window compaction strategy. It's only available, I think, after 3.5 or something like that. But anyway, we use SASE, and SASE was only available after 3.5. And we did a lot of fixes in 3.10 and 3.11. So honestly, to use Big Graphite, I would use only 3.11. That hasn't been released yet, but will be next month. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you handle the accuracy of your queries if Cassandra nodes fall down? Like, isn't it a problem to have uh, an, a query that does not get the correct result for mm -hmm. something that is monitoring? So, um, we have two. We have, we have one cluster with two data centers. On each data center, we have two replicas. We write with a consistency level of one, but from two different sources. And then we read with a consistency level of two. And most of the time, you will kind of get the data that you wanted. Uh, worst case, one single point is wrong. And most of the time, when you use monitoring, you look at medians, not average, or stuff like that. So it's kind of OK. It's not perfect, but that works well enough. And it's better than before, because before you had basically two separate clusters using Whisper. And there was nothing that tried to merge things together. So now, using the consistency level, the replication between the two data centers and everything, it's a little bit better. The other thing that we do is that you have two data centers writing the same thing to the same cluster. And when we read back points, we take, at least for aggregates, we take the points that add the highest count. So if you remember, you have value and count. And the point that wins is the one with the highest count, so the most precise one, okay, which is thanks. not perfect. But it's good enough. It's not banking, right? It's only checking if the CPU is at 80 or 81%. Thanks. Any other question? Yep. Uh, I, I don't know if you're in Cassandra, the same in H, as in HBase, but uh, can you compress uh, 
file under Cassandra or not? Uh, they are compressed by default, so yeah. Okay. And uh, what, what kind of compress ra compression ratio do you have? I don't remember. I could check. But I think it was more than 0 0.5. Uh, I can say I don't remember exactly. Okay. Well, because, yeah, we did some tests and we compressed by div divided by 10 and we also have better performances. With the thing is that, as I said, we don't really care about bytes currently because we have a lot of, uh, of space. So it will be better for us to disable compression and use more bytes because CPU is more of a bottleneck for us. But you can tweak that, and you can tweak that per table. And if you remember, you have um, each table is for a specific resolution. So you could compress more the later stages and compress less uh, the first stage or different depending on what you read back. And did you read the Gorilla paper from Facebook as well? Uh, yeah. And um, we might look at that. The thing is that if you want to do double delta uh, encoding, you need to kind of have a buffer of points, or at least to read back. Currently, we just get the points and write it. Uh, and we probably don't want to, to do that kind of thing in Python. So if we want to do fancy things, we might want to move to something else before. But Thank yeah. you. Uh, in addition to the time trading uh, optimization that you actually did, what are the optimization that you you went for? Um, on which side, in Cassandra or in yeah. the code? Uh, in Cassandra. So uh, I don't know if you know the what is it called? The coalescing window. Uh, the coalescing window is basically trying to group um, operation together in order to minimize the amount of uh, thread wakeups. And there was a bug there with an infinite loop. Uh, so it was more fixing a, a bug than optimizing, but still it worked better after. So we fixed that. Um, we also tweaked this setting to minimize the amount of, uh, of uh, context switching. Um, because we store 500k points per second, so that's a lot of small operations. So we need to make sure that we group them together at least on the customer size, side. Uh, another thing that we did uh, is using batching when we write to the same uh, partition. So you have batching in Cassandra. The thing is that most people don't understand it correctly. Uh, you can't just send all your operation and batch them together. If you want to be it to be efficient, you need to batch them by partition key. Uh, so we add a small delay on the carbon side, like 30 seconds, to have the opportunity of batching. And then we batch the points for the same metric there. So that's a small thing that we did. Uh, for the SASE thing, the case, so for the SASE indexes, there are a case that was super slow. It's when one of the constraints was matching nothing, it will iterate on all the table. So we fixed that. Uh, we, we changed the, the loop so that when one of the index was matching nothing and it was an intersection, you will stop directly there and not iterate later. Um, and I think we, ah, yeah, there was, we reduced the compaction time by 30% because one of the histograms used to compute statistics was used, using most of the time for compaction. So we made it, made it less precise, precise enough to be useful, but still, that really improved the CPU usage for compaction. So I think there are five or six patches that went uh, in uh, 3.10 and 3.11. Thank you. Uh, another thing that we did is that when you stream to add a node, uh, you have basically one, you used to have one stream per node, and we changed that to one stream per key space per node. So basically you parallelize per key space and the joins are faster because you use more CPU and bandwidth to do that. It could be better because uh, in Big Graphite we have only two key spaces and most of the time um, hundreds of tables, so we could go further and parallelize streaming per table, but already per key space was better. Hello. Apart from uh, the dependency problem you mentioned of using Elasticsearch as a backend, which other uh, downside do you see 
as using Elasticsearch instead of Cassandra for a backend, a similar backend for Revit. So, for us, it would have been fine to use only Elasticsearch or only Cassandra. Yeah. We didn't want to multiply the number of dependencies. Uh, we went with Cassandra because we felt like for the data part, it will be a better fit. And most of the tra traffic is for data. But then if you already have a stable Elasticsearch setup on a stable Cassandra setup, that would be totally OK to mix uh, data in Cassandra and metadata in Elasticsearch. We just wanted to make it easy for people to use. Um, currently, you just really need to have an existing Graphite installation, an existing Cassandra installation. You install the plugin with pip. You configure two lines of configuration, and you're done. The nice thing that we did, too, is that we have plugins that write to multiple databases. So in pre-production, when we wanted to test the thing, we did Whisper plus Big Graphite. So it writes first, first to Whisper, then to Big Graphite. And that made, us, that made it easy to switch from one to the other. And if you want to test the thing, then you can also enable the multi-plugin so that you still have your old production system, but it double writes to the new one, and you can switch from one to the other. But Elasticsearch could be fine for that. I'm not sure how it will behave for data. I haven't tried. But if you want to. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I guess we're done. Thank you.